Hey, everybody, welcome to Text Request Talks, where we have conversations with business leaders about how they make things happen. Presented by Text Request, the business text messaging platform that lets you text from your office phone numbers directly on your computer or any other device so you can stop making phone calls and start actually getting responses. Learn more at textrequest.com. I'm Kenneth Burke, and today we're talking with Charles Bonfiglio, who is the founder and CEO of Tent World. Charles, great to have you here. Thank you, Kenneth. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So kick it off. Hopefully this is an easy one, but you've been doing this for 42 some odd years now. And so why of all the things you could dedicate your life to, why start this business and why stay here? That's a really good question. Why does anybody do anything? Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's a game. It's a hobby. It's a passion. It's what I like to do. And I get to be able to, you know, initially build a system and then, the uh, results of that is helping other, you know, franchisees grow the same way I've learned as a franchisee first to grow from my franchisor. I felt I could do it better. I felt I, I had, I, I enjoyed helping other franchisees. So I felt if I was a franchisor and I developed the system that I always dreamed of, that I would be able to help other people do it the same way. And then can you break it down a little bit for us what uh, Tent World does exactly? So Tint World um, is an automotive aftermarket accessory business that does window tinting, paint protection film, vehicle wraps, car audio, video, lighting, truck accessories, wheels and tire packages, and such. Now, we also do um, residential commercial window tinting, and we do many of the services we do on cars, on boats, lighting and audio and paint protection and ceramic coating. So uh, we really have four, four areas of industry, automotive, residential, commercial, marine, and it all starts with the brick and mortar store of the auto styling center. You said you, you learned from a franchisor before you got into this or before you started this. Um, how did you start in that job? And then what made you want to make the move to building your own brand? So, you know, as a young, as a young guy in the teenage years, I, I loved cars. I loved, uh, I got good at working on them and doing car stereo systems in them and aftermarket accessories. Got very known in my area of Brooklyn. Um, and so when I got to a certain age at 21 years old, I decided I wanted to go open up my own accessory business. So I, you know, sold everything that I had, my cars, my stuff. I moved down to Florida. With, I took one, a one plane airplane ticket down to Florida with two suitcases packed and I was ready to go set up and open up a business. And I found real quickly that the banks wouldn't lend to me. Um, the landlords didn't know who I was or they were looking for a brand in their business. And I really couldn't get the business started. But then uh, a couple of months later, as I was you know, trying to figure it all out, uh, I found franchising. And I found it through a cousin of mine who opened up a Meineke discount muffler shop in uh, New Jersey uh, a year before I came down to Florida. And he told me, you know, try this out. And I gave him a call. And next thing I know, I got a letter back saying, you know, you've been preliminary approved to open up a Meineke uh, franchise. And, you know, that was the first yes I got down. I got when I was down in Florida and I figured I'm going to take the path of least resistance and I'm going to go with this. And when I called them up, they said, I said, what do you do for us? This is, well, we help you get a location. We help you get a loan. We help you, we give you a blueprint in the training program, how to operate the business with suppliers. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is going to save me a lot of time. It wasn't the business that I dreamed of, but it was definitely in the automotive area. And I felt if I can learn this, I can expand later on into area, areas that I really enjoyed in the aftermarket. So you learned that and then you did expand into your dream. Yes. Well, after building 10 of these in South Florida, um, and I, I, I developed a, um, a knowledge from how to run businesses and franchising. And, you know, I worked really close with my franchise or I became a, a committee member of their computer committee, of their uh, marketing committee, of the product committee. And by being and working with them and helping making their system better, I get to learn their business model really well. And it was really in, enjoyable for me to help other franchisees because I was involved and they were like, how do I do this? And how do I do this on the computer? And I just really loved helping other franchisees grow. I became one of their top franchisees in sales and stores. And I bought most of the properties that I owned in these buildings to lease them to my franchise. So I learned a lot along the way, financing, buying real estate, developing multi-stores, and then at one point, I built my last store in 20, uh, 2001. It opened up my last one. 
And I felt like I was, you know, I built these. I did a really good job. A couple of years later, I kind of looked at my wife and I said, you know, I want to I want to kind of build the business that I always dreamed of. I think I could do it better. And I think I want to do a franchise. And so at that point, I um, I, I knew this company called Tit World that started in 1982. And I called up the owner and they were, you know, built on a shoestring. But I liked the brand and I liked what they did. And they were he built six locations. So I called them up and I met with them and I offered to buy this, the business model. And I did. And in 2007, I launched Tent World Franchise. And um, and we've been just growing from there. You, you've talked a lot so far or a few times. You've mentioned that you really enjoy helping franchisees grow. Yes. And in what or what do you see is is are kind of the pillars to growth? I guess in my mind, initially, I think there's... Uh, professionally, you have to grow as a person to be able to perform better. You have to grow your customer base. So how do you acquire customers? Um, and then there's probably a few other components. Uh, yeah. So just talk me through that. So, you know, a lot of this stuff is just, I learned from experience of learning from a franchise that I was, I mean, you know, opening up one store is hard enough, but then when you start to open up multi-locations, like you're not prepared for that, you know? Uh, so, what I think is really important, you got to start with someone who's got leadership ability, because if you're going to have any kind of a business other than a job or a career that you own by yourself, you're going to have to learn to work with others and, and lead others. So I think that really you have to be able to be someone that people will want to work for, want to work with and want to have a they want to see your vision and grow with it. So um, that that somehow that was lucky. I was lucky that that came pretty natural. I was always excited about what I did. And I think it excited, excited other employees. And I was always willing to listen. I don't know at all. I know a lot, but I don't know at all. And I always want to learn. So by learning from them, it gives them the opportunity to, you know, to work within the business. And that's kind of was my mindset. Um, so you have to have first leadership ability. And you have to have the wherewithal to be able to open and run a business. It may not be for everyone, but if you decide to do it, you, you should do something that you like and that you want to do every day. Because if it's your hobby and you like it and you can get good at it, the fact is, is that it doesn't seem like a job anymore or a, or, or a, a work. It just seems like this is what I like to do. Um, and that's kind of what I felt. And I really didn't have a strong mind of that when I started. I didn't realize I was doing it because I loved it. I just thought I was doing it because I was working, but then I just grew a love for it. And next thing you know, it's like your strategy, you know, okay, how do I build my people? And, you know, how do I get customers to be happier and more experienced? And how do I give them, and they leave, not just that they got a transactional buy, but they actually feel like they was like, I really like going to that place. These guys are really nice to me. Um, and so that's kind of what I liked. So I guess the first thing is that, but then after you go on and you own a business, there's these other elements aside, leadership, financial wherewithal and mental wherewithal to run it. But you also now have to get marketing because if you have a good brand and you have good marketing, people are going to understand who you are, what you stand for and what, what you're all about. And you can't be all things to all people. So you have to find your customers who are likely to buy or come to your services. Um, and so that, that, that's a, once you get that figured out, um, now you're able to build a model and a business and a customer service experience where people come and they like what you have, but it's really, um, so that, and marketing is a big thing, but operations is, is important because you want everybody to understand what they're supposed to be doing, what positions, what are they required to do? What do they have to do? Once you have this all working all together, it wants it to be like a concert, a symphony of people just working and loving what they do and growing it. You just don't want it disorganized. So having a good system put together like that is really important. For acquiring customers, do you find that the same things work across territories or across the U.S. or are there things that are different based on region? It's working. That is something that's really the, the gap is widening. It uh, used to be you could do, I remember way back, it was just yellow page ads. No matter what you want, you put yellow page ads, you do a couple of direct mails. As it evolved, it came, you know, social media, then paid search and, you know, digital properties and, and, and all these other things that, that come through. 
But yes, the answer is yes. I mean, I have stores in certain areas of the United States that do very well on one platform, whether it be Yelp or or social, and then another area will do much better in in Google search or you know um, or maybe working you know maybe channels could be like marketing to uh, you know car clubs or you know home you know people that want window film in the homes. So there's definitely different groups, and you have to find out in each area what's your optimum customer because we do carry quite a bit of products and services. So every area is a little stronger in one area or the other. And so as we find that, which we do as a franchise, we have almost, we're really tracking close to almost every state that we can see what the is like. And then we apply that to the local franchisees. We do a lot of the heavy lifting, meaning that we do the bulk of the marketing for them. But we also coach them to do the things that you really need to be doing locally to get in their community and, and work well. You offer so many products and services. Did you start out that way or how did you decide when to add something new and what it should be? That is probably um, a long answered question, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, we only have this much time. So when I was a franchisee of, of, of Meineke, they primary, they sold as mufflers. But when I came down to Florida, they, I was wondering why am I not as busy as the stores up north? And I found out that it was because we didn't have the snow, the salt, the potholes. So our exhaust systems were lasting a lot longer and we didn't have as much demand. And so I, I realized that I needed to add other products and services. So I really learned from other friends in the industry and I started adding tune-ups and brakes and air conditioning services and all these other categories. So I had maintenance, tires, repairs, and I broke those in categories. And when I started doing that, I started becoming better for my, my customers because they were able to come to me and get one thing done. Hey, can you check this? And I didn't have to send them away when it was just mufflers. It was very transactional and I couldn't get more out of it and they couldn't get more out of me. So I just added those along the way and I saw how well it came for me and roll up in the late nineties, um, mining, you started to lose a lot of their business from EPA changes to the exhaust that was, um, you know, went from galvanized steel to aluminized and, um, uh, and um, aluminized steel um, and when they did that, or stainless steel, I mean, it lasted longer. And the catalytic converters were warranted from the factory a lot longer. From 30,000, they went to 100,000 miles. That slowed down their business, and they recognized me as someone who expanded my categories. They came down to Florida, where I was, to my stores. I was building the biggest, nicest stores with full service. And I sat with them, and we coached each other on how do we get all the franchises to add these other services so we can phase out of exhaust and go into these other categories. So that was a learning experience for me as well as the whole franchise system. I had a big part in that. Um, and then when I did uh, the Tint World brand, they were doing predominantly window tint and some other little detailing services. And I just wanted to do the same thing. I felt like if I want this to work everywhere in the United States and worldwide, we have to build these categories in the aftermarket. So whether it's, you know, window tint, paint protection film, vehicle wraps, the one thing that brings them back over and over and again is the detailing service. You have to ongoingly do that. So that gives us a chance to be relationship driven with our customers. And then we got the home services. And so all these things were categories that I felt it's going to make our business sustainable. So some people like a simple thing. They want to sell one product and that's fine. But if you want a sustainable business, and I learned this from my prior career with Meineke, it's got to be a broad-based business that's got these multiple categories and things are evolving. I look at each category and where it's forecasted to be in our future. And when they're all pointing in the right direction, we're the leader in our space, we're going to have good room to grow uh, sustainably. I, I really like the detailing as something to give, get people back again and again. You know, something that just will happen naturally. If you want detailing once, you probably want it again fairly yeah. soon. Um, but aside from that, or maybe it is, that is your your kind of gateway. But how do you get customers to come back to you? Well, you know, there's uh, multiple types of marketing. There's brand marketing that I believe is really important. Let them know who you are and what you do. It's awareness campaigns. Secondly, we have direct marketing when people are looking for something of the, what we do. Those are either paid uh, or digital searches that people do. Um, so whether it's organic or paid, at least we're going to be found. That's a really important um, and then um, the next thing would be, I would say, is, you know, remarketing. So when customers come in, you know, let them know what's due next, what they are interested in. They should you have a special on it. So that remarketing to customers um, is keeping them you in their mind. 
it's the lowest cost way to market to a customers and get more funds, people spending back at your business again, because it costs you more to get a new customer than it does if you're satisfying customers and you're getting them to come back over and over again for their existing business, cars or trucks or their homes or their boats, if they're coming back for all those services, you're building a long life relationship. Tim World goes way back. We have we have uh, fathers and grandfathers and kids that from generations, from 40 years of being in business have come back. Yeah, you did my grandson's kid. Now I do him one. I mean, it's amazing the relationship we've driven for so long. And we are unique in our space. There's really nobody that does everything that we do in the way we do it um, in the aftermarket space. No other franchise like us. So you're you're an owner, you're a leader, you are constantly driving growth. Do you ever take time to rest and recharge or how how do you handle that? Uh, you know, I don't I don't need a lot of recharging. Uh, my recharging is when my wife or my kids want me to go and do something with them. And usually we go on these vacations together and, you know, they could be three to five days, sometimes longer. But those trips we take several times a year together are the memories we make that we live forever. Um, so we just got back from Utah. Uh, two weeks ago, we went to Utah for, I think, six days. And we went skiing, snowmobile riding. And, you know, my son is uh, in his, coming in his last year of college. My daughter's a couple of years out of college. Um, and my, my wife and I, she's been, she worked with me for my very first business at 21 years old. So we're together every single day. Um, and so we're a family trip on the weekends. My wife's the leader. She tells me what she wants to do. I do that in between. I might be able to work a little, uh, during the week, I get to work all day long with my team and I enjoy doing it. It's me, my sport. Um, and my, you know, my scorecard is how well my franchises are doing. If they're all doing good, life is good. Um, if there's a problem, I attack those problems and I'm always looking, how do I continually grow our overall brand? In our system, you know, to really automate it and make it easy for our franchisees and also, you know, make it really rewarding for my my staff and my headquarters. And, and what are you doing to to keep learning? So you just mentioned, you know, if you see challenges, problems come up, how do you attack those? How, how do you keep pushing yourself forward? Where do you go to learn? You know, I, it's it's amazing. I just I never stop learning. Um, it could be from anything. Sometimes I'll I'll look at other brands. A lot of times I look at other industries. Like what's happening in another another industry that's really getting a hold of something and doing it really well. I'm like, wow, nobody's doing this in the automotive or the home sector. What about if we did that? How do I learn about that? Sometimes it's me doing the research and making deals, and sometimes I'll just hire someone. I'll just I just recently hired a new marketing VP that's basically going to come in and they were really, he was really, really good on home service brands. He took a company from a couple of hundred vehicles, home services to a, um, a $2 billion company. And so I want that guy to say, okay, I want you in charge of my home service. I want you to build my home services in that direction. So I, if, if I, I could do it myself um, and that's entrepreneurs have a big problem with that. We're really good at starting businesses but getting out of the driver's seat sometimes of every little job is hard. So, um, but I'm getting to a point right now that I've learned every time I put a high level person, because I can afford to now, you can afford to pay the, the, you know, what they really need to be able to do this job and also have a great culture at work. Um, so that's allowing me to grow and expand my insights. Sometimes it's things that I have to know as a leader, but there's sometimes that things that I I don't really want to dive into that every day. So I'll get somebody that can, that'll report to me. And that'll allow me to um, really grow and collaborate with other people. My head of IT, head of marketing, you know, the head of operations. If these are all aligned, we're given the reporting, the marketing, and the information that they need to share it with franchisees so they understand everything that's going on every single day. How do you approach hiring? Are there particular... Uh, traits or values that you are looking for? Are there particular skills or past experiences? I'm sure there's a little bit of variation between the role, but just talk to me about how you find great people because that's so crucial to running a good business. It really, it really is crucial. And I have found that I do better when I have someone, a recruit, the right recruiting firm, because I've used a few. And if you have a really good rec recruiting firm that kind of gets you and they, they kind of meet you and they know your team, your culture, and they, 
like usually within three to five people, I've got my person. And I really look, I mean, I, I just was recently hired for this marketing position. I think I, I interviewed five people that they sent to me and they were all really nice. But this one had the home services skill that I was looking for. And so I really figured this is the right one because it's an area I'm really good at marketing brick and mortar stores. I need somebody that's really good at marketing with mobile services brands. And um, that's a big direction we're growing in our, in our brand. So I hired for that, but I have to like them. I have to feel like they're a good fit first because no matter how smart they are and what else they know, like you really want to work every day with people that you like. If, if it's something, if it's a company that you're going to contract, maybe you don't have to like them so much. They do a job for you when you're done. But if they're going to be around my family, my, my franchise family, I kind of want people that are good people. And chances are, if I like them and trust them. My franchisees are going to like them and trust them and they have a good skill. So let's see if we can end on this on this question is of all the things you've talked about or all of your experience, is there one recommendation that you could give to other business leaders to help them go from wherever they currently are to that next phase? Um, I would say, um, you know, always look at what you're doing, because sometimes we get caught up uh, in everything we're doing. And sometimes you got to stop and sit back and look at all the things that you're doing really well. And what are the pain points that you need to either fix or grow or add to? From that point, it's just really looking at other companies that are doing it right and maybe learn on the high level of that. Write them down, make a list. I list every single morning I come in at lists and I focus on a certain amount of strategy time to figure out who, what, when, and how am I going to improve this particular area? I happen to be lucky that I don't really require a lot of sleep. I'm in here between 5.15 and 5.30 every morning, five days a week. That's before my staff comes in. I have that quiet time to do thinking, research, planning, and all the things that you really need quiet time for. And then they start rolling in and I start enjoying the company with them in the morning and getting everybody else set up. And that's kind of my routine, but that's really how to lay it out. Just always think about how you're going to improve your whole business model. Charles, I have loved this conversation. So thank you so much for your time and expertise here. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here with you.